Hello, everyone. Yeah, so we've heard a lot already at this conference from Sergey, from Steve, from Ben, from Kamal, from Rahul about CCIP, Chainlink's cross-chain interoperability protocol. And now I'm excited to tell you more about how we practice defense in depth, uh, and in particular about a component that's crucial to that, which we call the risk management network, and which I think is unique to CCIP, which no other cross-chain protocol on the market offers today. So this is based on joint work uh, with all of these awesome folks. Um, none of this would have happened without their hard work and their thoughtful contributions, so shout out to them. We live in a multi-chain world. Chainlink is live on 17 chains today, um, and those are heterogeneous chains. Some of them use the EVM, some of them do not. Some of them are layer ones, some of them are layer twos. Amongst the layer twos, some of them are ZK rollups, and some of them are optimistic rollups. Uh, they use different consensus algorithms, and so on and so forth. So it's a very heterogeneous ecosystem already today, and we, be we believe that with the, um, for example, app chain narrative and the emergence of layer threes, the ecosystem will only continue to grow. Uh, we will see more and more chains emerge, um, and in order for those chains to be useful, for those chains to reach their potential, we need to connect them. And this is where cross-chain protocols come into play, to transfer liquidity and to enable dApps on different chains to interact with one another. This is borne out by the numbers. So to date, more than $400 billion have been bridged, a staggering sum. Um, but it's not all a rosy story. There's a dark side to this as well. To date, over $2.6 billion have been hacked from cross-chain protocols. Um, and I think this is due to a variety of factors. These cross-chain protocols are inherently complex. Um, they involve a lot of different technologies. They target heterogeneous chains. You need to master distributed systems, cryptography, smart contract engineering. And if you get anything wrong, there are sophisticated adversaries waiting to exploit your protocol that even include state-level actors. Uh, what's more, these protocols present a large attack surface, and that's because they're running on public blockchains, they're running on the public internet, and so if there's any adversary worldwide that figures out how to crack your protocol, they're going to go for it and they're going to steal all your money. And indeed, just last week, I think we saw another hack of a cross-chain protocol for roughly $200 million. Incredible amounts of money at stake here. And this then has directly informed our design philosophy for Chainlink's CCIP protocol. End-to-end -end security is paramount. We need to minimize complexity and single points of failure. We need to practice defense in depth so that if, despite all the hardening we've applied to individual components of a system, a breach happens, we can mitigate that breach and we can contain the damage. And it means in our particular setting that safety is more important than liveness. So what I mean by that is that if there is a fault in the system, then I would design the system in such a way that the system loses liveness or halts rather than that safety is compromised, i.e. money is stolen from the system. And in the rest of the talk, I want to show at a technical level how that works and how we have integrated various defense and depth measures into CCIP's architecture. To do so, let me start by presenting here uh, the flow of a message through uh, the CCIP system, and then we'll return to this diagram uh, a number of times, and I'll point out where we have placed defenses in the system. Uh, so in CCIP, we have a message that is sent on a source blockchain from some kind of sender contract to the CCIP router contract, which acts as a single entry point that any user of CCIP uses to interact with the system. Under the hood, the message is forwarded from the router to the appropriate on-ramp. There's one on-ramp per destination chain. And if there's value or tokens in the message, those are forwarded to the appropriate token pool. There's one token pool per token contract supported by CCIP. Then, a little bit here as a kind of opaque box, the CCIP off-chain protocol works its magic. We'll see more about that later. And then the message goes to the destination chain uh, where, again, we have an off-ramp token pool and so on, and the message flows through a single router which acts as a unified exit point to the receiver contract. 
And I'll be telling you today about three defense in depth measures we have in CCIP. Uh, the first of these is rate limiting. That is to say, we can cap the value that flows in and out of CCIP um, to provide defense in depth. This is possible because CCIP is designed from the ground up to be value aware. Uh, so the green arrow here uh, points to uh, token and amounts. Um, this, this code is taken from the actual CCIP Solidity source code. And what that means is that messages in the CCIP system explicitly list the tokens and amounts of tokens that are being transferred as part of a message. And so the CCIP logic can be aware um, of that value and can take appropriate measures, you know, depending on whether the message transfers $1 or a $1 million. So this is the same diagram like we saw before. But now if you'll notice, there are some green shield icons placed on, the on and off ramps as well as on the token pools. And those are the points where the rate limiting defenses protect our smart contracts. So those are implemented as part of the smart contracts themselves. Um, and they're implemented as close to the edge of the system as possible. And by moving them close to the edge, uh, we can protect against a lot of issues that might arise sort of somewhere within the system. So we don't really care how an adversary uh, attacks us here, what attack vector they might use. Um, the rate limits will very likely um, be able to mitigate whatever attack an adversary might come up with. Um, and so, so the way these work is that for the token pools, they limit the amount of tokens per interval of time, so say x tokens per hour that can flow out of the token pool. Um, and for the on and off ramps, they similarly limit the amount of aggregate value that can flow through a particular pair of source and destination blockchain. Um, and so if we think about the typical usage of a, of a, a cross-chain protocol, um, their cross-chain protocol controls vast sums of money, but per unit of time, only a fraction of that flows through the system. And so we can enforce that that's the case. And an adversary, typically, if they manage to compromise or hack the system, they'll try to, in a single shot, take as much value as they can out of the system before their attack is detected and the system is paused or shut down. Um, but through these rate limits, we can mitigate a potential attack because we can greatly limit how much value the adversary would be able to extract if they were able to pull off an attack. So the rate limits we just talked about are implemented at the smart contract level. Next, I want to talk to you about the risk management network, which is a component that is unique to CCIP. Uh, the risk management network is a completely independent system. It's built in a different programming language than the CCIP primary system, Rust rather than Go. It's built by a different team inside Chainlink Labs. Um, and it applies a principle from the 80s that's been successfully used in other mission-critical industries like the aerospace industry uh, to cross-chain protocols. Um, so N-version programming is all about having multiple independent implementations of a system, running them in parallel, and comparing the outputs to make sure that they agree. And in the happy case, they will agree, and everything is good and can go ahead. Um, but if you ever notice a discrepancy in what these different implementations uh, output, then you know that there's a serious problem and you need to deal with it somehow. And you, this is a way to detect serious issues, basically. Um, in aerospace, it's a little tricky because you can't just stop flying the plane if you notice a discrepancy between the different flight computers. In CCIP, we actually have a much easier time because in CCIP, as I mentioned, safety is more important than liveness. So if we notice a discrepancy, there's a serious issue and we can simply pause the system. Uh, this also means that we can greatly minimize the trusted computing base, the amount of surface you have to trust to be willing to trust uh, the CCPI's CCIP system uh, because the risk management network is built from the ground up for simplicity and security. And so we end up with a total TCB size of only 10,000 lines of code, which is very tractable for a system that can do as much as CCIP does. So I'm very proud that we were able to actually run this in production and, and have this be a real thing today. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about how that works. And the first uh, defense that we can apply thanks to the risk management network here is cursing or anomaly detection. So the risk management network, now depicted here at the bottom of the CCIP off-chain system, continuously monitors all of the blockchains involved in the CCIP system. And if it detects any anomaly, it can shut everything down right away. So an example of such an anomaly is depicted here, where we see a false message going from the router on the destination chain uh, to the receiver contract 
for whatever reason. We don't really care how the adversary managed to pull it off, but let's say the adversary does. In this case, the risk management network will be able to detect the anomaly. Similarly, if for whatever reason we see a token flow that shouldn't be there from a token pool to some adversarial address, that's another type of anomaly that the risk management network can detect. And if it does so, it can immediately send what we call a curse transaction to all of the risk management contracts on all of the chains that CCIP is active on and immediately halt everything, shut everything down, give us time to investigate the issue, mitigate it, and so on and so forth. So now if I combine this with the rate limiting I talked about before, I have a very powerful defense because an adversary only has one shot um, before the anomaly detection kicks in and the system is halted. Um, and that shot can count for much because the rate limiting prevents how much they can extract in that one shot. Um, and it's a very broad class of protection here because, again, we don't really care too much how the adversary achieves their attack, which attack vector they use uh, to pull it off. Uh, we can um, protect against all of those and mitigate all of those attacks. Now, this brings me to the, to the final defense, which is also implemented in the risk management network, uh, and which, which I think is very strong as well, and that's blessing or secondary approval. And this goes back more to the concept of inversion programming I had talked about before. So again, let me walk you through an example of, of how that works. So here we see a good message indicated in green on the source chain. It goes through the usual flow we had already discussed earlier uh, between the different contracts. Uh, and now we'll peek a bit under the hood of the CCIP off-chain system and how the three uh, Oracle networks, each consisting of many independent oracles, actually function to then have that message executed on the destination. So in a first step, the committing DON will relay a cryptographic commitment to the message. Here, in indicated by the green message with a check mark on the, on the destination chain to the off-ramp. The off-ramp will store that commitment. So now we have a green check mark on the off-ramp. Message is stored, great. But we cannot execute it yet. If the executing DON were now to try to execute the message, it would revert because we do require, and this is codified at a technical level in the smart contracts, secondary approval by the risk management network before any message becomes executable. So the risk management network will independently um, construct its own approval or blessing of the message, and it will send that to the risk management contract on the destination chain. And again, we will store that blessing in the risk management contract. And so now that we have the two check marks, now that we have the message independently approved by the primary systems committing DON and the risk management network, only now does the message become executable. And now the executing DON can do its job, execute the message, it goes to the receiver, value goes to the receiver, everyone's happy. So what this means is that the risk management network has to explicitly approve any message before it can be executed. And this is very powerful because if there's any issue in the primary system, again, could be a key compromise, could be collusion by node operators, could be um, some kind of software supply chain vulnerability, could be some other bug. We don't care. We provide broad spectrum defense against all of these issues. And because the risk management network is an independent system, it's extremely unlikely that it would be affected by the same issue as the primary system. That brings me to the end of my talk. Um, thank you very much for, for listening. Uh, I hope you take away how CCIP practices defense in depth through three measures, uh, rate limiting and the risk management network being able to curse and bless. Um, I hope that you take away how this provides a broad spectrum of defense against many different types of attack. We're not just protecting against particular small attack vectors, but really try to protect against everything that could possibly go wrong here. I hope you, you take away how N-version programming is a very, full, very powerful paradigm in this setting of cross-chain bridging, where we care deeply, deeply about safety. Um, and I'm proud to announce that the source code for the risk management network is now publicly available on GitHub. Uh, go check it out um, at this link that's listed here in the slides. And uh, yeah, in the spirit of crypto, I hope that you can you know, read the source and convince yourself that CCIP is indeed uh, as secure as I just claimed. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>